Spanish, and I'll see you uh, at the end. Okay. But uh, so I hand over now to, to Debbie to introduce uh, tonight's webinar. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Um, and a very warm welcome to all our members joining us this evening. Um, and a particularly warm welcome to all our new members. We're delighted to say we've had a, a bit of a spring surge in membership in the past couple of months uh, with hundreds of new members joining. So if, if you're one of them, then a, a warm welcome. And we very much hope you enjoy your membership um, and all the treats to come. Um, our bird population is also enjoying a little bit of a surge at this time of year. And I'm really pleased that James is here to tell us all about the migrant birds that, that make their home in Sussex in the summer. And uh, uh, hopefully by the end of his talk, we'll be a little wiser about uh, who they are, why they come and how they make some of these incredible journeys. So I will now hand over to James. Thank you, James. Lovely, thank you, Debbie, thank you. Well, hopefully you all will, um, yes, uh, <laughs> know a little bit more by the end of the presentation, although you might all feel that uh, a bit of an information overload. So just bear with me on that one, folks. Anyway, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining me today. So for those of you who haven't met me before, uh, my name is James, I'm a learning and engagement officer with the Trust. Uh, and I've been with the Trust now for uh, three years, actually, three years last month, uh, prior to COVID, you would have found me essentially leading guided walks uh, all over the county, um, showing everybody the fantastic wildlife that Sussex has to offer. Obviously, we haven't really been able to do that in recent times, but uh, I'm certainly keeping my fingers crossed that we can get back to that time very shortly uh, and we can all get out there together and, uh, and uh, look at some of our fantastic uh, birds and wildlife. So without further ado, let's uh, jump into the presentation. I will need to get through it quite, quite quickly today, everybody. So I will rattle through some parts quite rapidly. So for those of you who join me uh, for the winter bird presentation, this is a bit of a follow up, uh, it follows a similar sort of theme. So we're just going to run through uh, a very quick section that was kind of in the winter birds talk as well, that's been slightly modified for summer. So um, just how many UK bird species do, do we have uh, in total? Well, we've got about 270 regular species across the UK and Ireland. Um, but actually, the total recorded species is actually a lot higher. It's around about 620 at the moment. So, of course, that is a huge difference in numbers. And, and, you know, why is there that difference in numbers? Well, it essentially comes down to how we classify kind of bird populations around the UK. So we have these different kind of classifications. We have resident birds. Uh, these are birds that generally stay in the same location all year round. Uh, we have birds which are partial migrants. So this is where some individuals remain resident, but others leave to overwinter elsewhere. Uh, of course, we have our summer uh, breeding visitors, which are the ones we're going to be looking at today. Uh, we've got our winter visitors, uh, birds that typically breed in the Arctic, but are drawn to our kind of more mild winter climate. And they, of course, were the ones that I concentrated on during the last presentation. Uh, then we've got our passage migrants, which are birds that are seen in the UK, uh, but it's usually as they travel between their breeding areas and their overwintering areas. Uh, and then we've got our vagrants and these vagrants are actually uh, the birds that comprise the 350 odd species um, that I was just talking about. The difference between the 270 and the 620. So we're not going to be covering vagrants today. So it was just to sort of indicate uh, quite how many of those species are vagrants. So is it that simple to categorise uh, sort of bird migration? Well, it isn't really, folks, because the reality of it is that, you know, migration is always adapting. Uh, you know, it occurs in all these different kind of scales and different forms. Uh, and, you know, up to up to probably about half of the UK's uh, sort of 10,000 or more bird species actually migrate in some capacity each year. Um, generally, the vast majority of birds that do migrate are generally those that live in kind of seasonal environments. Uh, hence why most of our bird species uh, are migratory in some form or other. Um, so generally, you know, the, the kind of distribution of birds is it's very rarely static. It's always changing, uh, you know, in response to things like sort of climate change uh, and a whole variety of different ecological factors. OK, so as a whole, uh, probably about two thirds of the UK's regular bird species actually fall within two or more of those migratory categories. So as I said, today we're going to be looking at sort of summer visitors. Uh, and we might also just have a quick, a very quick look uh, at some passage migrants. We haven't got too much time uh, to look at too many of the passage migrants, so we'll sort of fly through those quite rapidly. So how many summer visiting bird species do we have? Well, across the whole of the UK, uh, there's probably about 70 summer visitors. Now, around about 50 of those actually stay in the UK to breed. Uh, but what about in Sussex? What do we have in Sussex? Well, in Sussex, around about 32, uh, give or take one or two, you know, sort of either way, 
uh, actually stay here to breed in the county. So those are the birds that we're, we're going to be looking at today. Now, of course, the vast majority of our summer migrants don't actually arrive in summer. Uh, this is this is pretty plain. So the majority of the birds obviously arrive in spring, like the cuckoo with his suitcase here, uh, and, and they leave in autumn, of course. So actually, this talk really could have been uh, spring, summer and autumn birds, to be honest with you. But we'll call it summer birds. That's absolutely fine. So, you know, in summer, more than 16 million individual birds will typically make their way to the UK and Ireland to breed. Now, I should probably say that almost all of the species that are drawn here in summer, uh, you know, they spend their winters uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And actually, there are very few exceptions to this, uh, probably only about three, which actually winter primarily north of the Sahara Desert. Uh, these species are, are probably ring ouzel, uh, which is a bird that actually overwinters uh, largely in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. Uh, the black cap, surprisingly. So a lot of black caps actually overwinter in northern Africa, north of the Sahara, uh, and also around the Mediterranean as well. Uh, and also the Eurasian dotterel, but the dotterel is not a bird that breeds in Sussex. We're not really going to uh, cover that today. Now, what about spring arrival and autumn departure as a whole? Well, I just want to kind of give you an idea of the typical kind of migration routes and crossing points uh, for most of our Palearctic migratory birds. So this really is dependent on where these birds breed uh, within the Palearctic. But the different sort of migration routes, uh, essentially, if we look at the red one here, uh, this is the kind of the most uh, probably prominent one for most of the birds that arrive in the UK for summer. So this is known as the Eastern Atlantic Flyway. Uh, as you can see, it crosses uh, from Africa to Spain and up through Europe. Now, if we look at the blue route, uh, this one's known as the Adriatic Flyway. Uh, you can see that it crosses from North Africa uh, to Sicily through Italy uh, and follows that kind of route, particularly for birds that are sort of breeding in Scandinavia. Then you've got the green route, which is known as the Black Sea and Mediterranean Flyway. Uh, you can see that has all sorts of different paths and different uh, possible kind of breeding locations, depending on the species. Uh, and then the yellow path uh, is the East Asia, East Africa Flyway. So bear in mind, this is a little bit approximate. And the one thing I would say, everybody, is that there's a lot of crossover between these. So bear in mind that a lot of individuals, you know, within species, they don't all follow the same route. You know, that that is that is definite. So there's an awful lot of crossover, but it gives you a kind of rough idea what these migration routes are. Now, uh, there's actually quite a lot of really, really key migration sites uh, across the Palearctic that are fantastic for seeing migrant birds, both in spring and summer. So I'm just going to kind of show you where they are and they really do follow these kind of migratory uh, pathways. So the first one is this one here. Oh, it's gone. Sorry, I didn't mean for it to go, folks, but that was the Strait of Gibraltar <laughs> uh, between North Africa and Spain, of course. So number two uh, is the Orgambodetska Pass. Uh, this is in the Pyrenees. This is also uh, a, a very, very important kind of migratory point. And then the next one we've got is the Strait of Messina. So this is between Sicily and the boot of Italy. Uh, again, very important. So all these straits are really kind of important areas because they offer uh, the smallest amount of water to cross, uh, essentially, for these migratory birds. So it means that they can stick generally to as much land as possible. Uh, number four is uh, Faustabo in Sweden, uh, which is just up here. Again, a very, very important point. A great spot for uh, watching migrating birds. And the next one is uh, Burgas in Bulgaria. So this is on the, uh, the western coast of the Black Sea. Very, very important stopping point. Uh, then you've got the Bosphorus in Turkey. Uh, some of you might have been to the Bosphorus. Uh, this is a very, very important sort of uh, migratory point, um, especially, of course, for birds that are uh, migrating, you know, through from Asia uh, into Europe and, uh, and, and the other way, you know, in the, in the opposite direction. Uh, next one, Batumi in Georgia. Um, very, very well known for, uh, for raptor migration. Uh, so on the eastern coast of the Black Sea. And then perhaps uh, Isla in Israel. Um, in the Red Sea, again, another very, very important point. So all of these places uh, are fantastic spots um, to see bird migration in action. Now, of course, we can't really get to any of these at the moment, folks, although ironically, uh, Gibraltar might be viable soon, mightn't it? So uh, perhaps the Strait of Gibraltar is the place to go, uh, but probably not in the peak of summer. That wouldn't necessarily be such a good time. OK, so let's move on. So, of course, this long distance migration, you know, it is a very risky strategy for birds. So, you know, just just why do they do it when there's so many risks? Um, and I've done a little word cloud here just to show you some of the potential sort of pitfalls of migrating. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because it will take a while, uh, even though there's a lot of repetition in the word cloud. But you can see, you know, inclement weather is, is a real threat to migrating birds, you know, storms and high winds and, and droughts. You know, these, these are all really prominent threats that birds face 
you know of course they run the risk of drowning you know particularly out in the Atlantic um, uh, you know especially due to sort of inclement weather uh, you know there's collisions with sort of human structures predation en route uh, you know disorientation uh, you know very wet summers and, and sort of um, you know, late snowfall, you know, when they're leaving the wintering areas, all of these things have, you know, have an effect. Um, and potentially they do make it very, very risky for migrating birds. Now, why do it then? Why do it? That is the question. So if we were to look at the kind of Palearctic as a whole and the different regions, then, you know, if we look at this region down in sort of equatorial uh, tropical Africa, you know, of course, there's a lot of food available all year round uh, in this part of Africa. But the problem is in spring and summer, there's huge pressure on the resources throughout the breeding season. Uh, there's also, you know, a much higher risk of predation because of the sheer volume of predators uh, within that region of Africa. And also the chances of sort of disease as well are, are, are much greater because of the volume uh, of sort of birds that are actually there. So if we move a little bit kind of north into the Mediterranean region, then, you know, the winters obviously are, are still pretty mild, uh, but there's actually reduced availability of food throughout the winter. But in spring and summer, you know, there's a wide range of food available. Now, in our region, uh, in, in kind of northern Europe, you know, the winters obviously can be very cold, uh, but there are insects around, you know, around the coastal regions. Um, and of course, this explains why we see a lot of winter migratory bird species as well. Uh, spring and summer, you know, food is pretty abundant throughout spring and summer. So it's a very, very good place for the birds to migrate to. Uh, up in kind of Arctic northerly latitudes, you know, the winters are incredibly harsh. Uh, and, you know, with the frozen ground and frozen water bodies, this is why most birds, of course, leave these latitudes in winter. But, you know, there's a real explosion of insects in the spring uh, and summer. And of course, the days are very long owing to the amount of daylight. Uh, so it makes some fantastic regions for, uh, you know, for breeding birds. So, you know, coming back to why do it? Well, essentially, it's for birds to be closest, you know, to the best kind of food resource, whether that be in the breeding season uh, all through the winter. So, you know, it is a very high risk strategy. Uh, but it's also very high reward at the same time. So, you know, how do birds find their way? Well, you know, to migrate effectively, uh, they essentially require a map. Um, obviously, they don't have a map, but uh, what, what they do require is a sense of direction. Um, and in essence, this really is, you know, it's a compass, really. That's what it is. Uh, but it's an ability to navigate from one place to another. Obviously, that's, you know, um, pretty obvious, but, but they do require that. Um, they also require, uh, you know, a sense of seasonal time, which in essence is, is the same as having a calendar. Um, but they also require a sense of sort of diurnal time, which, of course, is the same as having a, a daily clock. This is really, really important. Um, now, they won't necessarily need to take a game of birds memory with them. Uh, but what they do need to have is a decent spatial memory. This is really, really important. And bear in mind, all of this uh, potentially, you know, it can be packed into a brain the size of a pea. Um, and this isn't to denigrate, you know, birds and, and bird brains uh, to kind of use that phrase. It, it's the simple fact that, you know, the anatomy of some of our tiny songbirds uh, means that they really can't fit uh, a lot of brain size it, it, into the skull, you know. So, you know, as I said, they don't have any of those physical aids. So what do they have? Well, you know, they have this genetically innate programming, uh, of both a sense of kind of direction and time. Uh, and when I say innate, I mean, it's basically from birth. Uh, they also have this kind of geographical reference system. So some of it might be innate, but some of it is also learned, you know, particularly from, from the adult birds and perhaps, you know, from, from other birds of the same species. So I don't mean necessarily that they're going to be using Big Ben uh, and the Eiffel Tower for navigation, uh, but, you know, sort of landmarks are very, very important for them. You know, following coastal uh, routes uh, is obviously very, very useful, uh, particularly up the kind of Eastern Atlantic flyway, but also using kind of human landmarks like roads uh, is actually very, very handy. Um, and also birds have this ability to use kind of celestial cues for orientation. So, you know, they're able to use the sun and the moon uh, and also, you know, the position of the stars as well. So these, uh, you know, are all really, really useful navigation tools. But of course, they're also they're not static, are they? They're not static. Uh, so this does mean that this sense of kind of diurnal time this sense of daily time is really, really important, um, you know, to be able to use these kind of celestial cues effectively. Now, they can even use uh, the sort of polarised light. You're probably all wondering why I put a pair of polarised sunglasses in, uh, but it's actually using polarised sight, uh, sorry, polarised sight, polarised light, uh, you know, particularly at sunset, uh, enable, in order to kind of, you know, uh, determine orientation as well. So that's quite a useful aid for them. Now, other than that, um, they're also able to use the Earth's uh, geomagnetic field, you know, the magnetic compass, 
which of course is not used just by birds, used by other animals as well. And, and also the use of kind of auditory and olfactory systems to aid navigation. So what I mean by this is actually that they, they're able to use the hearing. Uh, so effectively, you know, the, the sounds of uh, sort of winds as they, as they hit hills and mountains and the, the changes in sort of sound sensation, you know, the sounds of breaking waves on distant shores, for example, these can be really useful clues. Um, but even as, uh, you know, um, we might be familiar, for example, with birds, you know, predicting impending weather, like sort of rainfall. Uh, and they, they seem to have this kind of innate ability to detect kind of changes in barometric pressure as well. Uh, and this is really, really useful um, because, of course, it means that potentially they can, you know, sort of follow rainfall or, or escape rainfall, depending uh, on kind of localised pressure changes. Now, they can even use smell and smell actually is really useful, uh, particularly for some kind of seabirds. Uh, because as I'm sure you may all know, if you've ever been to a seabird colony, uh, they can be quite smelly. Um, and, uh, you know, some seabirds actually can use this sort of sense of smell um, to help them uh, navigate back to their breeding colonies. And of course, there's also collective decision making, which is sort of follow the leader style flock migration. So really what I'm saying with all of this is there's no one uh, sort of thing that birds use for, for kind of navigation uh, on migration. They use like this kind of combination of factors uh, in order to, uh, to uh, navigate effectively. Okay, folks, so now we're going to move on to the summer birds to look out for in Sussex. Uh, not every single one of them, it has to be said. Uh, otherwise, this presentation might be, uh, might be about eight hours instead of the predicted two. Uh, I'm only kidding, only kidding, probably. Anyway, so let's start with the, uh, with the passerines. We're going to start with the passerines. So the passerines are the perching birds, and that's owing to the arrangement of their toes. Uh, and I thought what we'd do is we're going to start with the tricky brown ones, everybody. Uh, and the reason we're going to do that is because I need to, uh, I need to do the tricky ones uh, while everybody's still paying attention before anybody drifts off. Uh, so what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to start off with the warblers. So uh, I'm sorry to hit you all with the warblers straight away. I know that's uh, that's not ideal, but uh, we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to do it. So, yeah, I mean, warblers, they can be really, really tough. They can be very tricky. So, I mean, you know, trying to identify the difference between a reed warbler and a marsh warbler by sight. Not easy, folks. Not easy at all. Not easy at all. But we're going to go through them all a little bit for you. So British warblers, you know, we've got 14 breeding species overall. We've got two resident warbler species, the Chetty's warbler and the Dartford warbler. Uh, we're not going to look at those today. And the reason we're not is because they're residents. They're not uh, summer visitors on their own. So we're going to look at the summer visitors instead. So of the summer visitors, uh, we have the grass warblers, uh, the Locustellidae, uh, and these comprise the grasshopper warbler and the Savies warbler. Then we've got the reed, the marsh and the tree warblers, uh, the Acrocephalidae. Uh, and these comprise the reed warbler, the marsh warbler and the sedge warbler. Uh, then we've got the typical warblers, the so-called typical warblers, the silver day, which has traditionally always been a bit of a dumping ground for warbler species. I think this genus has actually been split again just to uh, add additional complication, but we're certainly not going to go into that today. So these, um, these warblers comprise the black cat, the garden warbler, the common white throat and the lesser white throat. And then you've got the so-called leaf warblers, the Philoscopidae. day. These comprise the chiff chaff, the willow warbler and the wood warbler. So these are our 12 sort of summer visiting warbler species. OK, and what we're going to do is we're going to start off by spotlighting one of these species, uh, perhaps one of the most familiar, which is the, uh, the rather lovely black cap. So here you've got a lovely male uh, with its black cap and a female, which should really be called a brown cap. <laughs> but, you know, that would be silly because they're the same species. But suffice to say, the female obviously doesn't have a black cap. She has a kind of russety brown cap. Now, the black cap, it is a very, very common summer visitor, uh, you know, more than one and a half million pairs. And actually, Sussex has about three percent of the UK total, which is a significant number of birds, to be fair. So black caps, uh, you know, they typically arrive from sort of around about the third week of March um, and they tend to peak in sort of April. So for those of you who are really familiar with black cap song, uh, I'm sure you're finding that you're hearing an awful lot of black caps around at the moment. So uh, black caps, you know, they migrate from sort of West Africa uh, and the Mediterranean, but you can see from this map, actually the darker blue regions show that a lot of black caps actually overwinter both in North Africa uh, and all around the Mediterranean as well. Now, uh, it's interesting with the black cap that a, a kind of central European population, which mainly stem from Germany, uh, actually overwinter in Britain. And this is quite a recent sort of behavioral change. Uh, and one of the fascinating things about it is, is, is most of these birds that actually overwinter here uh, you know, from Europe, you know, these birds will obviously get back onto their breeding territories much quicker uh, than those that are returning from sub-Saharan Africa. So this gives them a real kind of, you know, ecological benefit. Um, and uh, it's probably one of the reasons why the black cap is actually doing rather well 
uh, as a species in the UK. Uh, so generally it's a bird that favours kind of deciduous mixed woodland uh, with a bit of understory. So you often will find them in mature parks and gardens. And as I was saying, it, you know, it's flourishing as a whole um, and also probably a warming climate is really helping the black cap out. So I just want to spotlight a little bit on uh, spotting and listening for those of you that are not too familiar with the black cap. Well, you know, it is quite a grey brown warbler, really. A lot of warblers are quite brown, but the black cap really is quite grey. So the sexes are dimorphic in terms of they obviously look different. But first year birds uh, actually have the russety brown cap, even if they're males. Uh, and what happens is they start developing black feathers uh, within the russet brown cap, which will tell you that it's a young male. Now, of course, that black cap is not actually distinctive to the black cap. There are other UK species of birds like the marsh tit and the willow tit uh, that do also have black caps as well. But they're a much, um, they're a much podgier bird, folks. They're, they're much more rounded and also they have these little black bibs as well, which are very distinctive. So the black cap is much more elongated. OK, so uh, the black cap is a very active bird. Generally, it likes to stay within cover um, and generally it's the song that will first kind of alert you to the black cap's presence. Uh, it really is a warbling warbler as well. So not all warblers warble. Some of them don't have the most inspirational of songs, everybody, I have to tell you. Uh, but actually the black cap is a great songster and it has actually caused it a lot of confusion with Nightingale over the ages. Uh, it, it has a really distinctive song, actually. The tempo is really, really distinctive one, once you know it. And it's because it has these kind of two distinctive elements, which is this sort of scratchy kind of preamble, which is quite distinctive of its family uh, and then it has this kind of melodic kind of cascades of descending notes so I'm going to play that for you now so you can have a listen to it There you go, folks. So hopefully you all uh, were able to kind of detect that slightly scratchier element to the beginning of the song. So you too tend to find if you're quite close to a black cap, uh, you'll hear the kind of scratchier element. But if you're a bit further away, then you just tend to hear the kind of fluting notes. So actually the pitch and the tone of the song, they're quite similar to Blackbird, uh, but it, it's very much a faster song. It's like a Blackbird, you know, on fast forward, basically. OK, so it also has this rather distinctive kind of call that you'll often hear in the woodland. And it's this kind of tongue clicking uh, tech call, which I'll play for you now. Now, for those of you familiar with the stone chat, uh, you might think, oh, that's very similar to a stone chat call, which sounds like two pebbles being knocked together. And you're absolutely right, it is. But the one thing I can tell you for sure, uh, if you hear this from within a woodland, uh, it's not a stone chat, folks. So uh, it's gonna be a black cap. Uh, some of the other warblers do have quite similar calls. So just to be aware of that, but the black caps is very distinctive. So the black cap has a very similar relation, uh, which is the garden warbler. And this bird is even more timid. Uh, it really doesn't like uh, sort of straying out of cover. Now, interestingly, I was in a location this weekend where I was able to watch a few garden warblers and there was only a couple of times uh, where these birds actually popped out of cover to sing. They're really, really shy and they, they really don't like being approached either. Um, now, the garden warbler is interesting because you might be looking at it and thinking, well, that is. Oh, oh, sorry, folks. A bit of a bit of a mistake. Technical hitch. <laughs> Technical hitch. So what I was going to say, actually, is that the garden warbler is um, it's a really kind of undistinctive bird you know it has no distinguishing characteristics it's really uh, sort of dull looking dare i say it uh, and actually it's those that that kind of lack of features um that that makes it very distinctive because it is such a plain looking bird so here's its song Okay, so the main difference really with the song of these two birds is that the, the garden warbler, the phrases tend to be a lot longer and they don't have these distinctive kind of descending flute like notes. Um, it's more of a sort of cascade, you know, it, it's very sort of insistent. It, it doesn't really have these separate sections, uh, but it, it kind of it's almost like a kind of babbling brook of song, I suppose you could say.
Now, uh, generally, as I said, you know, this is a bird that really does like kind of scrubby thickets, uh, particularly amongst kind of coppice woodland. Uh, it's very much not a garden bird. It's really, really misnamed. So unless you have a particularly large mature garden uh, with lots of coppice woodland and lots of scrubby thickets, then you're probably not going to be seeing any garden warblers, to be honest with you. OK, so garden warblers, unfortunately, you know, they really have declined in the south of the UK. Um, and that's quite consistent with kind of trends across the country, unfortunately. Uh, and it may well be that kind of increasing numbers of black caps are actually putting quite a lot of pressure on the garden warbler. OK, folks, so we're going to move on to the white throats. So the white throats can cause a bit of difficulty, but we're going to separate these two for you now. And the two white throats are the common white throat and the lesser white throat. So I'm going to give you a little a few a few little tips now on how to separate these birds. Now, if you get a good view of them, uh, it's actually not very difficult. But the problem is that you very, very rarely get a good view of a lesser white throat. It's quite tricky. So the common white throat is a much more conspicuous bird. Uh, often they'll allow you uh, relatively close, but they will often scold you with a, with a sort of uh, a churring call when you get quite close. Now, often you'll see the common white throat in this in this jerky little song flight where it will take off from a bramble thicket or something similar. Uh, it'll be singing in flight and then it will disappear back into another sort of section of uh, bramble or hawthorn. Now, it's quite a, a restless bird. Uh, as I said, it kind of flits between scrub and hedgerows. But the lesser white throat is a really skulking, elusive bird. And actually, in the breeding season, they're really, really tough to see. Um, and the best thing to do if you really want to try and see lesser white throat is, uh, you know, try a bit harder once the breeding season is over, uh, because they become a lot more prominent once they start feeding in amongst mixed flocks. Now, the lesser actually, it really does show a preference for the, for the kind of densest of scrub. And the way that you'll know it is around uh, is because its little rattling song gives away its presence. And this is what it sounds like. So it has that lovely little rattling appendment um, at the end of the song. There is a little bit of a scratchy section beforehand, uh, but again, you do have to be quite close to the bird to hear that. So when you're uh, when you become tuned in to this this little rattling song, uh, you'll realise that there's a lot more lesser white throats around than you think there are. Now the common song, uh, it, it's very very different. Uh, it is also very scratchy, uh, but it doesn't have any of the trilling. It's just a kind of well, it's just a bit of a jumble warble. To be honest with you, it's very hard to uh, to sort of say exactly what it sounds like but again you, you when you hear it a lot it becomes very very familiar so this is what it sounds like So the one thing I would say as well, in actuality, it actually sounds slightly more scratchy um, than it does on the computer. But sometimes this song is extended a bit more as well. It's often the verses are a little bit longer than, than they were there. Uh, but because it is quite a common bird, um, actually, you know, once you get quite familiar with this, you'll, you'll, you'll be quite aware of it. It will become quite, uh, quite easy to discern. OK, so the common white throat, um, when, particularly when they're agitated, they often have this kind of peaked crown, uh, which is quite, quite prominent. Um, and the, uh, the closed wing is really, really distinctive on them. And that's because they have these rusty brown panels on the closed wing. Now, if you compare that to the wing on the lesser white throat, for example, you can see it's quite uniform in coloration. And actually, these rusty panels are easily uh, the, the best feature for, um, you know, identifying a common white throat from a distance, particularly if it's not singing. Uh, they also have these these quite sort of pale yellow brown legs and also a very pale eye ring as well. Now, the lesser is a, is a smaller, much grayer bird. Um, it doesn't have the kind of rich brown tones that common white throat does. It has these very dark ear coverts behind the eye, very dark legs. So the legs are a lot darker than they are on common white throat uh, and also a dark bill as well. So quite distinctive, actually, the differences between the two. OK, so just a few little quick facts on the uh, typical arrival. Well, the common white throat typically arrives in the first week of April. Uh, I think I started seeing them probably from about the second week of April this year, uh, there or thereabouts. Uh, and the lesser is usually a little bit behind uh, a, a week or so later than the common. Uh, in terms of migration, well, the common white, th uh, white throat pretty much all migrate from this, uh, this kind of tract of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, extending all the way down into the south. 
but the lesser white throat actually has uh, quite a different range because the UK is right on the edge of its sort of breeding range, the very far kind of northwest. Uh, but actually, they overwinter in, in a kind of vast tract all the way across Arabia uh, and through into Asia and India as well. So it's, it's kind of subject to very different migration pressures uh, to the common white throat. Um, so what's the general outlook? Well, for the common white throat, Sussex has, you know, a lot of uh, good sort of scrubby habitat, uh, you know, help increase the population of common white throat. Uh, the population actually did, did suffer a pretty severe climb back in the 1960s, uh, but they, they do seem to be recovering. Uh, the lesser white throat, you know, general kind of tidying of the countryside, uh, you know, obviously this continuing kind of loss of hedgerow since World War II, um, you know, do make it vulnerable. Uh, and also the lesser white throat, it has very kind of selective uh, migratory stopping points and uh, this does put them at risk because of course if these areas suffer uh, from sort of habitat degradation then uh, then it means that uh, their stopping points are, are sort of threatened. Okay folks so now we're going to move on to, uh, to, to some reed bed warblers instead. Uh, it's all about the rhythm, really is all about the rhythm for these two birds. So these two birds essentially are the reed and the sedge warbler. Now they look quite different, if you get a clear view no problem at all, the sedge warbler in particular is, is actually a very distinctive bird. Uh, but the songs can cause confusion. Um, in fact, a lot of people do find it quite difficult to kind of tell the difference between these songs. And the reason is that sometimes you get little snatches of song uh, and they're not always in full flow. So it can actually uh, cause a bit of crossover between the two. But when I say it's about the rhythm, it really is because the reed warbler, you know, it's a real reed bed specialist. This is a bird that very much lives up to its name, but its rhythm is very, very steady. It's very consistent. It doesn't tend to deviate from this rhythm very often. Uh, they will weave kind of mimicry of other birds into the song, but not extensively, usually just a few species. Uh, I tend to hear reed warblers, uh, you know, doing blue tit and great tit quite often. That tends to be quite common, probably because they're relatively common birds, you know, in close proximity to them. Uh, so, of course, the reed warblers hear them quite, quite regularly. So, yeah, so the rhythm is very, very steady. So take a listen to this now. <laughs> Okay, lots of squeaky notes as well, everybody. There's always lots of squeaky toy notes in, uh, in Reed Warbler's song. They tend to have less grating notes. Uh, and actually the grating notes you tend to hear more within Sedge Warbler song. So the Sedge Warbler, uh, you know, again, it's not quite as tied to reeds uh, as the Reed Warbler. So these are birds that basically inhabit sort of marshes and ditches in close proximity to reeds. Uh, but often you'll, you'll sort of see them singing from, from kind of scrub uh, surrounding. Uh, interestingly, actually, when I had a previous role uh, surveying corn crakes uh, up in Scotland uh, on, on the islands, on the Outer Hebrides, and uh, I could hear sedge warblers singing all through the night there. Um, so they're, they're really not averse to singing at night. And it was quite a lovely chorus, actually, to, uh, to hear that all the time because they are a great, great little songster. So the sedge warbler, you know, it's a much, much jazzier singer. It is really jazzy compared to the reed warbler. You know, it has lots of changes in kind of tone and pace and pitch and, and complexity with a bit of mimicry as well. So I'll just play that for you now. <laughs> So there you go, folks. Hopefully you could all really hear the, uh, you know, the, the dramatic changes in rhythm for the sedge warbler. It's really, really distinctive, you know, there's lots of those kind of grating notes as well. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a heads up on the differences between the two. OK, uh, so the same but different. What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean are these two birds, uh, because these two birds are incredibly similar in look. So these, of course, are the chiff chaff and the willow warbler. And by far and away, the easiest way to split these two birds are by their songs. So this is the chiff chaff. Mm -hmm. 
And this is the Willow Warbler. Very, very different. So it has this fruity little descending cascade of notes in comparison. Okay, so actually the Chiff Chaff uh, is known as the Zilpersalp in Germany, I think. And uh, I like Zilpersalp because Zilpersalp, I think, is very... Uh, it sounds more like the onomatopoeic song than Chiff Chaff, if you think of Zilpersalp, Zilpersalp. Whereas Chiff Chaff, it doesn't sound quite so like Chiff Chaff, does it really? But, but never mind, never mind. So yeah, Willow Warbler, a lovely descending little song, kind of more similar to a Chaffinch song, uh, certainly in its structure, but it doesn't have the, the kind of double notes and the little flourish that, uh, that Chaffinches do. So the Chiff Chaff uh, has very dark legs, very, very dark legs. Uh, but the one thing I would say with the dark legs is even though the Willow Warbler has lighter legs, uh, it, I wouldn't go on that trait alone. Uh, and the reason for that is that the, the kind of surrounding light in the time of the day really has an effect on the colour of the legs, unfortunately. Now, the second thing I've marked here is, is the wings, the so-called primary projection. Uh, and the reason I've done that is to say, although it's not that easy to see in this photo, uh, the Chiff Chaff has these rather short sort of blunt primary feathers, primary wing, wing tips, uh, whereas the Willow Warbler, they're, they're much more, they're much longer. And the reason for that actually is because the Chiff Chaff is generally a, a shorter distance migrant, whereas the Willow Warblers fly a lot further. Uh, so therefore their, their wings are longer, basically allowing these kind of longer flights. Uh, now, also, if you happen to see a Chiff Chaff feeding, one of the things that they tend to do is they habitually dip their tail. They do an awful lot of tail dipping when they're feeding. Now, again, you do have to be a little bit careful because obviously if the bird isn't feeding, then it may not be doing that much tail dipping. Uh, the willow warblers will do it, but not, not to the same kind of extent. So if you do see one of these little uh, leaf warblers, a little philoscopus warbler, and it's doing a lot of tail dipping, uh, it's definitely going to be a chiff chaff, even if it's not singing or calling. So the chiff chaff, uh, you can see from this map here that actually a lot of them overwinter in northern Africa, uh, in Spain and around the Mediterranean, uh, which is another reason, or is the reason, why the population of chiff chaffs are actually doing pretty well. They're increasing, they're increasing. So in the same kind of manner as black cap, to be honest. However, the willow warbler is not doing so well, not doing so well. So, yeah, so what's happening to the willow warbler? Because the thing is, you know, the willow warbler was once, you know, it was Britain and Europe's most common summer visitor. So we would actually have been seeing about two and a half million uh, sort of breeding willow warblers in the UK every year. Um, but actually, you know, there's been kind of national declines of more than 30 percent. You know, Sussex has suffered even greater than that with more more than double the, uh, the, the kind of, you know, more than double that number. Um, you know, most birds now have kind of withdrawn from coastal areas, you know, they've withdrawn from the downs and it leaves most of the population uh, essentially on kind of heathland, um, you know, in kind of the Ashdown Forest and stuff like that. You just don't hear as many willow warblers uh, in Sussex as you once did. So it's pretty bleak, actually, the outlook for the willow warbler. Um, it doesn't seem that the declines are really slowing down, which is really, really sad. So the willow warbler is a very, very light bird, very tiny, only weighs around nine grams, uh, about the same as a pound coin. And they complete, you know, one of the most arduous journeys of any land bird, especially considering their size. Now, in actual fact, some of these willow warblers, um, you know, migrating from southern Africa, they, they'll actually have really long sea crossings across the Mediterranean. Uh, and some of them will cross the Sahara uh, and the deserts of the Middle East without food or water. Now, there is one subspecies uh, of willow warbler that will fly all the way from South Africa, following that route uh, to Siberia. So this tiny little bird that weighs nine grams uh, might complete a, a 15,000 mile annual migration. Now, I know we think of the, uh, the Arctic tern as the king of long distance bird migration, but, you know, the Arctic tern is a much bigger bird in comparison. Uh, you know, this thing's absolutely tiny. So I think that's phenomenal. So, you know, you have to uh, you have to give the willow warbler credit. So next time you see one, then uh, definitely, uh, definitely worth thinking about that. Absolutely phenomenal feat of endurance. OK, now, is it a bird or is it a grasshopper? Well, to be honest, folks, this is a presentation about birds. So uh, obviously this isn't going to be a grasshopper. But, you know, if you heard this, then what would you think? Now, hopefully some of you might have been lucky enough to hear that because that is a phenomenal sound and it's actually a bird that sounds like a grasshopper uh, and it has very it, it's very cunningly named because it's called the grasshopper warbler uh, which is quite appropriate really isn't it it's quite appropriate so i have to be honest folks it, it it is a pretty it's a pretty rare bird in sussex you know you'll be doing quite well 
to see a grasshopper warbler, but it's such a fantastic <laughs> bird and such a great uh, sound that I just had to play it. So of course they're able to pump out, you know, huge amounts of, uh, of sort of double notes every second. Uh, and that makes it, it gives it this kind of insectivorous uh, like buzz. And this is why they belong to that genus, uh, the locust elidae, uh, the locust unsurprisingly. So generally they arrive from the beginning of April. Uh, it is of course a sub-Saharan migrant. And you can see from this map that actually their wintering distribution is really limited. It's really patchy. Um, so there's certainly not huge populations uh, of grasshopper warbler at all. Generally, these birds will actually undertake the lengthy migration by night. Uh, it, it, not only does it kind of sound like an insect, but uh, it even moves like a mammal. So it, it's, you know, it's the most unbird like bird, to be honest with you. Um, and if you are lucky enough to see one, they're often scuttling around on the ground. So they, they really they really do look mouse like. They're a very, very strange bird. Um, you know, their population is always kind of fluctuating, uh, although unfortunately, you know, th their overall trend is, is certainly for decline. Uh, and as you can see, the wintering areas are so limited um, that undoubtedly that, that is a significant issue uh, with their population. So it's a really, really precarious breeding state status in Sussex. Uh, and by far and away, you know, you're most likely to see a grasshopper warbler uh, on passage, particularly at a coastal site. Uh, although the thing is, it's probably not going to sing, folks, so you're going to have to try and spot this bird uh, in the undergrowth, which I'll be honest with you, it's going to be very difficult, but uh, give it a go anyway. Okay, so uh, now for a few really, really rare Sussex breeders, and actually this one is even rarer than the, uh, the grasshopper warbler. So the chances are that we probably have no breeding Savvy's warblers in Sussex anymore. Um, you know, this bird was really driven to kind of UK breeding extinction. Uh, owing to kind of drainage of the fens back in the 1800s but the reason I put it in here is because the song is actually even more uh, it's even more intense than the grasshopper warbler so let's just have a little listen to it oh sorry folks I think, I think I've just damaged my hearing with that actually it's like my ears started ringing a little bit but uh yeah incredible incredible sound absolutely phenomenal Anyway, so we'll move on to the marsh warbler now. So the marsh warbler uh, is very, very similar to the reed warbler in look. Uh, you know, it, it's possible, maybe, uh, you know, there's a couple of breeding marsh warbler in Sussex, but, you know, they're right on the brink, everybody, unfortunately. You know, this is a bird that actually tends to breed in the, the sort of herbaceous vegetation surrounding reed beds rather than in the reed beds themselves. Uh, and they're actually a very late arrival as well. They tend to arrive at the end of May or, or early June. And the reason I've mentioned this actually because the marsh warbler is probably the UK's most incredible mimic. Um, you know, I'm never going to be able to demonstrate this in a kind of brief snippet of song, uh, but if you are ever lucky enough to hear a marsh warbler or go to a location where there is one, then, uh, you know, I really do strongly urge you to make the effort because they're capable of mimicking over 120 different species of bird. Uh, most of those are, are birds, you know, that are familiar to the marsh warbler, both in the UK uh, but also in their overwintering grounds in Africa. So fantastic little bird. I'll just play you a little snippet of their song anyway. Okay, folks, can't really, can't really play for too much longer. I think it's quite a long clip, that one as well. But uh, it probably hasn't really done the Marsh Warbler full justice. But the thing that I really wanted to emphasise was how different uh, the song is to that of Reed Warbler. You know, it doesn't have at all that kind of regular steady rhythm uh, that Reed Warbler has. Some of you might have heard a few kind of UK bird species being mimicked in amongst that lot. Um, but it is a superb mimic. So, if you, you know, if you catch one in full flow, absolutely phenomenal. Okay, so the last one is the Wood Warbler. Now, the Wood Warbler is not... It's not actually, uh, well, I mean, you find them sort of quite extensively in other parts of the UK, but unfortunately in Sussex, uh, it's now become really rare as a breeding species. So there might be a few hanging on in there, uh, up in the high weald, but not very many, unfortunately. So there's probably about 7,000 breeding territories in the UK overall, and most of those are concentrated over in the West. Um, so, you know, over in Wales and, uh, and uh, you know, sort of closed canopy woodland in that part of the country. 
Um, generally, you know, we tend to see them on sort of passage uh, as opposed to being a, a sort of breeding bird here. But uh, unfortunately, you know, they've seen quite a big decline in their in their breeding population. So these belong to the same family as the chiff chaff and the willow warbler. They're one of the Philoscopus warblers. And they've got a really great song, actually, that I just want to play to you, just in case you are lucky enough to hear one. So they have two components to the song. They have this uh, this first section, which I'll play you first, which sounds a bit like a nut hatch. And then they've got this fantastic spinning coin song. Uh, so have a listen to these two, everybody. So there's the piping song version. There you go, folks. Love that. I love that. That spinning coin song is absolutely brilliant. Love that. One of my favourite little bird songs. Fantastic. Okay, so let's move on to the hirundines now, everybody. So what do I mean when I say hirundines? Well, what I mean is the swallows and the martins. So, of course, we have the barn swallow, and we have the house martin, and we have the sand martin. And I've kind of tried to make them roughly size relevant, just to give you a sort of idea uh, how big they are in relation to each other. Now the barn swallow, it's smaller than a starling, so it's actually still quite a compact bird. It has these long tail streamers, uh, but do be careful because juvenile swallows actually have relatively short tail streamers, so they can be confused for house martin if they're not particularly close to you. Uh, they're this beautiful iridescent blue above. Uh, of course, they've got this very distinctive uh, reddish throat with a dark chest band, uh, and these, these rather long pointed wings. Now swallows, of course, you know, they swoop and glide when they're feeding, uh, they'll often perch on wires, uh, so if you're lucky enough to have some wires close to your house, uh, you might be lucky enough to have some swallows perching on them, which is always a pleasure. Um, sometimes you do see them on the ground when they're gathering nest material early on in the season, uh, and they tend to forage very low over water and meadows. So if you see, uh, you know, hirundines flying very low, uh, sort of over a meadow, uh, hawking insects, then it's very likely that they're, they're probably going to be swallows. They could be sand martins, but, you know, that's, that's another thing entirely. OK, so you can see their, their uh, wintering uh, movements. Essentially, they're located pretty much across the whole southern half of Africa. And they've got a lovely chattering song. With those lovely uh, fizzing sort of scolding electrical notes as well. It's a great thing to hear. It's a real sound of summer, isn't it? OK, so the house martin. The house martin is actually a really compact bird. Uh, it always staggers me to think that a house martin is smaller than a house sparrow. It's quite incredible. I mean, you, you never really think that when you see them in flight. And it's because, you know, the wings are actually quite long in comparison to the bird that it doesn't appear like that. But if you see them, uh, you know, sort of nesting in the eaves of a house in comparison to a house sparrow, it's quite surprising that they're a little bit smaller. OK, so they are quite a plump little bird. Uh, I mean, it says with short wings, but I mean, the wings uh, give them the overall appearance of looking bigger than a sparrow in flight. Um, so blue black above that iridescence of course and then there's the, this pure white below so they don't have that uh, you know that red throat and the sort of dark chest band that swallow have now they have this really really uh, distinctive and diagnostic white rump so by far and away the easiest way to recognize a house martin in flight is when you see them from above and you see this uh, you see this white rump which neither swallow or sand martin has okay so they've got a rather short pointed tail which is quite distinctive Generally, they're less agile than swallows. You know, they, they sort of, they don't turn quite as often. Uh, but the key point is they tend, to, they tend to feed at higher levels. So generally, they're not the birds that you see sort of swooping around, uh, you know, low over the meadows um, quite as much as you do swallows. So you will see them feeding over water sometimes, but generally they stay, uh, they stay higher up. Uh, as you can see, they've got a similar wintering distribution to swallow. But interestingly, the house martin's always been quite mysterious. Uh, and truthfully, we don't really know where all the house martins go in winter. It's, it's, it's still a little bit of a mystery. These are the calls. So they don't have anywhere near the sort of chatter that swallows do. Uh, it's a much more kind of pleet, 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 a uh, much more consistent sort of note, you know, but, but very, very distinctive as well overhead. OK, so the sand martin is even smaller than the house martin. Can you believe it's the same size as a goldfinch? Uh, that's even more staggering than the house martin statistic, isn't it? To be honest with you, goldfinch, incredible. Uh, yeah, so the tail is only very, very slightly forked on the sand martin. Uh, they're a very, very uniform brown above. So you can see they do not have that distinctive white rump that the house martin has. 
uh, but they have this very distinctive brown chest band on the underneath of the bird. So if you get a good view of it, very distinctive, you know, brown chest band on sand martin, white rump on house martin, uh, and of course, no, uh, well, uniform rump on the top of a swallow uh, and clean white underneath. So very, very distinctive, these three birds when you see them uh, separate. So the sand martin has quite, uh, quite short, narrow wings, very, very pointed. Um, you know, they tend to feed quite communally. Generally, they're not as agile as swallows, uh, but they are very powerful flyers. You often will see them flying, uh, you know, quite low over the ground, hawking insects, uh, but they don't tend to glide as much as the other two species. Uh, and of course, they do tend to nest in, uh, in sand banks. Of course, there's a lot of reserves all around the UK uh, that have specific sort of banks for uh, sand martins to nest. So the sand martin, again, a similar sort of distribution across southern Africa to the swallow, but not, not quite as widespread as a whole. And here are the calls. So they're just a bit harsher. They're a bit more grating than, uh, than house martin calls, to be honest with you. Okay, so we're gonna do another species spotlight, folks. And the bird that we're gonna spotlight is the superb Northern wheat ear. The wheat ear, absolutely phenomenal bird. Uh, here's a lovely male and a female here. You can see the female kind of lacks the, uh, the kind of mixed gray and black tones of the male. Um, now the wheat ear is actually a very scarce summer visitor to Sussex. Uh, although we have, you know, a reasonable number as whole in the UK, in Sussex, you know, the wheat ear is predominantly uh, a passage migrant. So we've only got a very small breeding population, uh, a coastal breeding population in Sussex. Um, and actually, Rye Harbour is a very, very important uh, reserve for our, for our breeding population, which is uh, relatively small. So it's a really early arriving bird species as well. It really is a true kind of vanguard of spring. Um, but birds tend to arrive in sort of bigger numbers, really, from the end of March. Now, uh, they, they kind of migrate from this really extensive belt across sub-Saharan Africa. But the interesting thing about the wheat ear is it, it inhabits this absolutely vast range across the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so they, they really do inhabit everywhere. Uh, you know, it's a huge span right around the, the entire planet in the Northern Hemisphere. So, yeah, they tend to breed in kind of rocky and stony areas. And the best places to see wheat ears in Sussex uh, are really where there's short turf in coastal regions. So, again, yeah, Rye Harbour is a, is a great reserve for them. Unusually, they nest underground. Really, really unusual behaviour there. Um, and unfortunately, you know, because the breeding birds in Sussex are quite scattered, they're quite isolated, it does make them quite vulnerable to kind of localised extinction. Um, but, you know, the wheat ear as a whole is actually doing pretty well. Now, I want to tell you about the wheat ear's incredible journey, uh, or certainly one subspecies of wheat ear, which is a so-called Greenland wheat ear, uh, the Lucaroa subspecies. Now, this one's a lot more orange, actually. This is another male, but the orange extends a lot further down onto the kind of belly and the flanks than it does on our typical northern wheat ear. But the journey of this bird is absolutely unbelievable. So I just want to show you the migration routes. So essentially, some of the birds will leave West Africa uh, and they'll head into Northwest Europe. And then what they'll do is they'll make a direct three and a half thousand kilometer ocean crossing across the Greenland. Uh, and then they'll uh, they'll cross. Uh, they'll they'll sorry, they'll, they'll fly over to Arctic Canada. So these birds will complete around about seven and a half thousand kilometers one way. Uh, and it will take them a bit longer to get to their breeding grounds than it will to get back to their wintering grounds. However, there's another group of birds that actually travel from East Africa and they travel all the way through Arabia, uh, across the Sahara, through the Arabian desert, right the way across Siberia, and then they fly into Alaska. Now, incredibly, these birds are completing 15,000 kilometers one way. So, I mean, essentially that's getting on for 20,000 mile return journey absolutely incredible so bear in mind folks that these birds they only weigh two times two pound coins bit of a tongue twister there two times two pound coins so this is a very very light bird you know again we think of the arctic tern as being this you know this king of migratory journeys which it is but you know the wheat ear is a tiny tiny little passerine it's a really small bird so in my eyes this really makes the wheat ear the king of the long distance migration so i just want you all to think about this folks uh, the next time you see a wheat ear, just think how far some of these birds have flown because it is absolutely phenomenal. You know, I mean, it, it's a, a feat of endurance that is, is just incredible, absolutely incredible. So you've got to love a wheat ear for that. And they're very, very charismatic birds as well, I have to say. OK, so now we're just going to fly through a few species here. And these species are the spotted flycatcher, the red star, the yellow wagtail and the tree pipit. Now, the spotted flycatcher, you know, it's a, it's a declining summer visitor, unfortunately. You know, the numbers in Sussex uh, have declined quite substantially in recent years. 
it's quite a late arrival. Uh, they tend to arrive really from, from sort of early May, uh, which is quite, quite late compared to a lot of other migrant species. They tend to like kind of, you know, woodland with fairly diverse structure, but lots of kind of open rides and glades. Uh, and they have very distinctive behavior. In fact, flycatchers as a whole have very distinctive behavior because they often hunt from a kind of bare branch and they'll flutter out uh, to catch kind of insects in midair. And also they can be really, really bold actually. So often they'll allow you to get really close to them. They're very charismatic little birds. So do keep your eyes peeled for them. These are their calls. These are their calls and they're not, yeah, they're not, they don't have the greatest song, everybody. I have to tell you this, this is, yeah, this is pretty much it. For spotted flycatcher, this is about as vocal as they as vocal as they get. That, that's it. That's it, everybody. There you go. He's took. He's took. There you go. Spotted flycatcher song, everybody, folks. <laughs> okay. So uh, the common red star, beautiful bird, beautiful bird. Now, typically, the common red star, uh, you know, it is a bird of kind of western upland heaths. So actually, you know, we only have a very small breeding population of common red star. Uh, generally, you tend to find them, you know, in kind of open forest areas, uh, woodland edges, and they have very robin-esque behaviour. They're actually from roughly the same family of birds, the chats, uh, and that means that they, you know, they tend to loiter around on the ground quite a lot uh, and, you know, fly to low branches and then head back to the ground to catch insects. And often they'll sort of hover as well. They've got quite a nice little song. It's not not kind of dissimilar to, uh, to Chaffinch, but it tends to sort of tail off a little bit. Um, it's a bit, a bit more erratic, but I'll play a bit of song now. cooking in the background. <laughs> there you go, bit of Red Start song. So uh, if you want to see common Red Starts in Sussex folks, then uh, our reserve at Old Lodge is a really, really good place to see uh, to see common Red Start. And of course, you know, one of the very few uh, breeding populations of common Red Start in Sussex. Okay, so the yellow wagtail, uh, you know, it's a scarce and fairly localised summer visitor. Uh, they tend to arrive from kind of late March and, and they're really a bird of kind of lowland pasture uh, and wet grassland. You often see them kind of feeding uh, and sort of uh, feeding amongst cattle, you know, picking up all the kind of insects, uh, you know, around them. Um, and yeah, often they will perch on sort of posts and wires, which makes them very distinctive because they're a really, really beautiful bird. Um, and I should say uh, they, again, their vocabulary pretty limited. This is basically all you're going to hear. Yep, that's it. That's it. Just a little upswept flight call, folks. A little pursuit, pursuit. So if you listen out for that uh, from migrants flying overhead. Now I should say as well, folks, if you see what you determine to be a yellow wagtail and you live in a town or a city, uh, it's very likely that it's not a, a yellow wagtail. It's probably going to be one of these, which is a grey wagtail. So the grey wagtail is half yellow, uh, just to add a bit of additional confusion. But this is very much a bird uh, that tends to inhabit, you know, kind of areas of uh, kind of water bodies, you know, within towns and cities as well. It's also a very, very attractive little bird. OK, so the next one is the tree pipit. Uh, it's a very, very localised summer visitor. Uh, you know, it really is a bird of kind of heathland and open woodland edges, uh, you know, clear field, clear field areas. Um, you know, it, pipits, fortunately, they tend to kind of live up to their names. So, you know, we have tree pipits, uh, we have rock pipits and we have meadow pipits. And while it's not absolutely categoric, generally, they, they tend to sort of roughly adhere to their uh, to their names, fortunately. So tree pipits have a very, very distinctive song flight where they sort of ascend quite rapidly uh, and then they parachute back down. And they've got a really, really lovely song as well. It's a really beautiful song uh, to listen to on, on, on a kind of UK heathland. <laughs> Lovely song, everybody. Lovely song. Now, not to be confused with their much more common cousin, the meadow pipit. Uh, so the tree pipit generally is kind of, uh, you know, it's larger beaked. But one of the key things to look out for, you know, outside of the, the song, for example, uh, is looking at the flanks of the tree pipit. They have very, very fine markings on the flanks. Whereas on the meadow pipit, the meadow pipit tends to have quite thick markings all the way down onto the belly uh, and on the flanks, which is quite distinctive. OK, so we're going to do another quick species spotlight, folks. And this time, well, we've got to do the nightingale, haven't we? We can't miss out on the nightingale. Uh, 
I mean, what a bird it is. What a, what a songster. So it is a fairly common summer visitor, but I say fairly common. I mean, it's not that numerous. Uh, but of course, the most prominent thing is the huge declines in population in recent years. So Sussex actually is a real stronghold county for the Nightingale. We've probably got around 12% of the UK total, amazingly. Um, yeah, I mean, the South East as a whole holds almost the entirety uh, of British Nightingales. So, you know, their entire range has really kind of contracted uh, in recent years. So generally they arrive at the beginning of April um, and uh, they, they overwinter in this fairly narrow belt uh, south of the Sahara. And they're a real niche specialist, you know, they like these kind of dense thickets, uh, you know, lots of scrub, uh, but usually in close proximity to, to water. That's what they particularly like. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that nightingales really need is they need this kind of diversity uh, of vegetative structure in a landscape that isn't fragmented. And of course, the big problem we have in the UK uh, is that, you know, our best habitats are, are really, really fragmented. So this is a real problem for the nightingale. So, you know, for that reason, the nightingale has been subject to really extensive study. Uh, and, you know, we've lost more than 90 percent of them uh, over the last half century. So it's uh, it's a very sad state of affairs, although the birds in Sussex, you know, their population, it seems relatively stable. But it is quite a small population, bear in mind. So the nightingale, otherwise known as the night songstress. Well, the night songstress is a bit misleading because obviously it's the male nightingale singing. Uh, so it's not really a songstress, is it, to be honest? Um, and listening to the nightingale, well, let's just talk a little bit about their song. Well, of course, it is one of the most, the world's most prodigious songsters. Uh, but, you know, in terms of look, uh, wow, it's, uh, it certainly doesn't have the visual clout to, uh, to back up its, uh, its uh, vocalizations, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, it's very much a skulking bird of the understory. It's a very difficult bird to see. Um, you know, being a kind of niche specialist, you know, they really do inhabit some pretty prosaic habitat, to be honest with you. Um, and they will sing through daylight hours. So don't think that, you know, if you if you sort of hear one in the daytime, that it won't be a nightingale, because males that are actually holding territory do tend to sing throughout the day. Um, and the song is really quite odd in a way. You know, it's a real kind of technical tour de force. You know, it's full of kind of whistles and grunts and groans and screeches and croaks. Uh, but it just has so much variety. You know, that's the thing about it. Um, you know, they can perform so many syllables. In fact, uh, an independent study showed them to perform, I think it was somewhere in the region of 1,140 different syllables, um, which, you know, in comparison to Skylark, which was about 340, uh, and Blackbird, that was about 110, it really goes to show the kind of variety they have. They just have so many individual phrases, you know. And probably the best thing about the song is it's really inventive. It has a, this kind of fizzing energy, uh, but also lots and lots of restraint. And it's really, really dramatic, you know. Uh, and once you've learned it, you, you really won't forget it. You know, you won't confuse it for any other bird. It's very, very distinctive. So I'm just going to play a little bit of it for you now. Well, there you go, folks. That's probably about all we've got uh, time for. Otherwise, we'll be here all night, won't we? Um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, considering its, its kind of position, uh, you know, within culture and folklore, you'd think that the nightingale is actually a really well-understood bird. But in truth, uh, it's really been a mystery for a long time because we just haven't known, uh, you know, very much about their migrations. So it was only about a decade ago uh, that the British Trust for Ornithology actually attached, uh, you know, 20 nightingales with uh, little geotags um, just so we could see where these nightingales were going. Um, and actually one bird, it, it showed that it took quite a long time. It took quite a, it, quite a, quite a relaxed journey, actually, uh, down to its uh, sort of overwintering location in, in Guinea. Uh, but actually, it was pretty much from July to December. So unlike some birds which are completing the journey uh, in just a matter of weeks, uh, this nightingale took a very, very relaxed approach. Uh, very relaxed approach, but very interesting information. OK, so... Just a few birds just passing through. So this is a very quick category, folks. And this is birds that don't really, they're not breeding in Sussex. They're just passing through on passage migration. So the pied flycatcher relative to the spotted flycatcher, very pretty little bird, uh, a bird really of kind of Western woodlands uh, in the UK. But, you know, look out for them, uh, you know, particularly in April and August passing through. If you're very lucky, 
you know, particularly uh, perhaps in areas of the weald, you know, you might even hear little snatches of song in May or June. Just play you a little bit of their song. So the song is almost like a, it's like a slightly slowed down, more staccato dunnock, I would say, but definitely a bird to look out for on uh, passage migration. So the ring ouzel, uh, the ring ouzel doesn't breed in Sussex, uh, but look out for them passing through from late March to May, uh, otherwise known as a mountain blackbird, very, very pretty bird with that white crescent on the chest. The wind chat, the wind chat is another bird passing through, uh, again, passing through from late April, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, and also the serin. Interestingly, serins are, uh, have actually been spotted every month in the UK. Uh, look out for them between March and June. It's tiny little kind of uh, finch species, very, very small, very unusual buzzing song as well. Uh, also red back shrike. So red back shrike uh, it actually used to be a breeding, uh, a breeding bird in Sussex. Uh, look out for them passing through from May to June. Uh, otherwise known as the butcher birds, the shrikes, due to their tendency for, uh, for hanging their prey on kind of uh, thorny branches for later. And also the golden oriole. Uh, the golden oriole, look out for one of these beauties uh, in, in May, uh, although admittedly your chances of seeing one are fairly few and far between. Funnily enough, I did actually see one of these uh, a few years ago at a, at a London wetland centre, um, but I was very surprised to see this bright yellow and black bird fly straight past me. So uh, it goes to show you, you know, you can see them, you never know. Uh, and also the blue throat. The blue throat as well is another bird that might pass through. Uh, generally in kind of later autumn, but sometimes they might pass through in late April. So for any of you who are thinking that I've just photoshopped these last two birds, uh, you know, photoshop the colours onto them, I assure you they are genuine. They really are genuine and very, very beautiful. Okay, so we're going to move on to, to wading birds. And actually this lovely little species here, uh, which is the, uh, the diminutive little ringed plover. Very, very pretty little bird. It's actually a very scarce summer visitor to Sussex. Um, we only have around 1% of the UK's breeding total. Uh, and as you can see, the UK's breeding total is not very high. Uh, so 1% of those is uh, very few, is very few. Uh, they arrive really early. You know, they really are a kind of harbinger of spring um, because they tend to arrive really from the beginning of March. And uh, they migrate from this kind of extensive belt across the equator. Uh, but they have this huge breeding range. You can actually see from this map that they, 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 they literally breed pretty much everywhere from North Africa, all the way over to Japan and all the way up to the Arctic. So a huge breeding range. Um, they really do favour man-made habitats for breeding as well. They like these kind of lowland wetlands, um, you know, on kind of bare and stony ground. But the thing is that because they have this uh, sort of preference for fairly transient human habitats, it does mean that they're, they're very vulnerable to localised extinctions, unfortunately. Okay, so I just want to give you a few spotting tips because there is a bird to confuse them with. Um, and that essentially is the, uh, well, I'll get to it in a second, but the little ring plover uh, has some very, very prominent features. It's very tiny. It's only the size of a house sparrow, really, really small. Uh, it has this really, really prominent yellow orbital ring around the eye. You really can't miss that. These rather fleshy legs and a thin, dark beak. Lovely little bird. And the bird that you can confuse it with is its kind of sister relative, which is the much more common resident ringed plover. Now the ring plover, the adult in the top picture up there, very, very distinctive. So it has this bright orange beak with a black tip, uh, these bright orange legs, and a much more prominent black breastband as well. So it's very, very different from the little ring plover. Now, it's actually much easier to confuse the juveniles, which are down at the bottom of the screen here. And the biggest difference is that on the ringed plover, the more common ringed plover, it has this, uh, the, this, this paler supercilium, which is this stripe just above the eye, uh, above the front and the back of the eye, which the little ring plover really doesn't have. Uh, the little ring plover also has a slightly paler orbital ring. So the juveniles are a bit harder to tell the difference, but the adults are, are a fair bit easier. It's always worth looking out for, uh, for plovers foot trembling as well, which is when they're feeding, they do this little dance where they shake their feet, um, basically just kind of tapping to try and disturb uh, little insects up for feeding. So it's a very funny thing to watch. Okay, so just a few waders passing through. Actually, we don't really, that, that's pretty much the only summer sort of uh, breeding wader species we have, the little ring plover. Uh, Wimbrels are passing through right now uh, from late April to early May. So look out for this uh, relative of the curlew. Uh, very distinctive call as well. You'll often hear these calls. Often in uh, notes of seven or groups of seven, the notes quite common. Green shank are also passing through, a relative of the red shank, but a much paler bird uh, with sort of fleshy green legs. Uh, again, right now is a great time to spot them. 
Uh, wood sandpiper as well, slightly, slightly finer, more delicate bird. Um, and some of them you might see passing through in May, uh, although the peak of wood sandpiper is passing through actually is a bit later in summer. Curly sandpiper, very similar to Dunlin, uh, with a curved beak, but slightly longer legs. Um, again, look out for them between sort of mid-April to mid-May. And then just a few more that will fire through. This fantastic bird here, uh, is always a possibility of seeing a stone curlew. It's a very, very rare breeding bird in Sussex now. Uh, and it's the only British representation of a, a family of birds known as the thick knees. Um, and you can see them really anytime through sort of spring and summer passing through. Uh, there's a, a kind of reasonable breeding population in East Anglia. So lots of the birds will be heading in that direction. So just to show you uh, as um, a comparison here, the bird you're actually looking at is the one on the right, Little Stint. So bear in mind the Dunlin on the left is a very small wading bird. Uh, the Little Stint, however, is a really, really small wading bird uh, because it's actually only about the size of a sparrow. So it's absolutely tiny. Uh, and Little Stints generally will be passing through round about this time. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled for them. It also has another relative known as the Temminck stint, very similar looking, similar size. Uh, and again, most of these also pass through in May uh, with lower numbers in autumn. And then also the redneck phalarope. So the redneck phalarope generally pass through quite late. Uh, and this is owing to the fact that they breed in kind of high uh, Arctic latitudes. So late May and early June uh, is a good time to keep your eyes peeled for these. Okay, so what about water birds? Well, what about a duck that visits for summer? Well, it's this fantastic thing here. Absolutely beautiful. What a lovely male this is. Really, really nice. The female's quite an attractive duck as well. Um, and this is really, really unusual because all of the British duck species are either resident or they're winter visitors, which I covered in the winter presentation. Uh, and this duck is the gargany. So the gargany is also known as the summer teal. Uh, it's a duck that just comes here for summer and they tend to arrive typically from sort of late March. Um, they are quite a rare species, I have to say. So most of them just pass through as passage migrants. Uh, and it's very likely that there's, there's perhaps only around about 100 pairs that breed across the whole of Britain. Um, you know, they migrate from this kind of broad sweep of sub-Saharan Africa in uh, much the same manner as many of our other migrants. Um, but, you know, poor management of kind of wetlands across uh, Europe have really contributed to a, to a bit of a decline in Gargany, unfortunately. So it's really important that all of their, their kind of, particularly their wintering areas are also protected. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, hunting is a big problem, uh, as it is for a lot of duck species. Um, you know, the outlook, though, for Gargany is pretty good. Um, you know, quite a few reserves across the county are seeing kind of breeding success. Uh, so it looks pretty encouraging for Gargany into the future. Okay, so we're just going to move on and look at the terns, folks, quickly. So a few seabirds. Now, the terns that we have that you're most likely to see in summer are these ones, the sandwich terns, these ones, the common terns, and these ones, the little terns. So the sandwich tern is quite a scarce summer visitor. Uh, it's quite a large tern species, larger than a black-headed gull. Uh, it has a very distinctive black beak with a yellow tip, uh, short black legs. I love this picture down in the bottom left as well, fantastic. Uh, it's a very pale bird and it has uh, quite an obvious forked tail in flight. It also doesn't have any streamers. So, for example, common tern has, you know, a, a little bit of streamers. Uh, and Little terns have sort of little streamers as well. Um, and also arctic terns have, you know, kind of decent streamers. But the sandwich tern really doesn't. Uh, and it has this very distinctive crested black cap, which will actually become uh, sort of white speckled uh, later on in the breeding season. And then eventually it will start to turn white from the, uh, from the front of the head back. Now the sandwich tern, uh, generally the populations kind of fluctuate year on year. Very distinctive kind of raucous calls. <coughs> so a really harsh grating call from the sandwich tern. That'd be a very familiar sound to anybody who uh, frequents Rye Harbour quite a lot. Now the common tern, uh, it's a fairly common summer visitor. It's smaller than a black-headed gull, so a fair bit smaller than the sandwich tern. Has a very different beak, an orange-red beak with a black tip, uh, short red legs as opposed to the black legs, and longer tail streamers and sandwich tern. You can see its distribution as well, uh, also kind of around uh, around Africa. And unfortunately, my own image is in the uh, in the way of the rest of the map, so I can't really see the rest. But I think the uh, the distribution does does also extend over to the uh, to the east as well. Call wise. Squeakier, not as grating as the sandwich turn, that's for sure. There we go. 
and their population as well uh, it's relatively stable actually it's relatively stable there's not not uh, too much sort of uh, not too much decline in those at the moment so the little turn of course is a very scarce summer visitor in fact there's all sorts of conservation measures in place for little turn uh, at a number of reserves across the country uh, it's a, a really a, a very very much a specially protected bird uh, it's actually a really small bird as well it's a really small turn it's only about the size of a starling it has this very distinctive yellow beak with a black tip so in uh, stark contrast to the sandwich term, which has the black beak with a yellow tip. So fortunately, all the terns have uh, very useful beak colours. It's only really the common tern uh, and it, um, its beak is very similar to Arctic tern. But these three terns are quite easy to separate. Now it also has a forked tail and uh, these yellowish legs as well. And a very, very distinctive black eye stripe as opposed to a full black hood. You can see its distribution here. So around sort of Southern Africa and Western Africa and around uh, the Arabia as well. And unfortunately, the population of Little Turn has been declining uh, in recent years quite significantly. So these are its calls. Oh, that's it. That's it for that, that call. All done. OK, so we're going to move on to raptors very quickly. It's quite a short section. So the bird of prey that I want to uh, concentrate on the species pot lie is the hobby, which of course is our diagnostic uh, summer visiting raptor. Very, very pretty bird. Really, really lovely, lovely. So it's a scarce summer visitor. Uh, Sussex probably has around about 5% of the UK's uh, hobby total. Fortunately, the population seems to be doing pretty well. It's actually on the increase, which is good. Generally, we start seeing them from the middle of April. You know, if you live in coastal areas, uh, then if you're lucky, you can, uh, you know, you might see a hobby sort of passing through. Uh, as it arrives from the continent and the numbers really tend to pick up in May as well, uh, particularly with the, um, you know, with the emergence of lots and lots of dragonflies as well. So they migrate from a fairly extensive region of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, extending all the way down to the south. And they're very distinctive in flight because they appear like a giant swift, you know, they have these large uh, scythe shaped wings. And although it's quite hard to tell that from the picture on the left, uh, when you see them in flight, it's really characteristic. Um, it's certainly the thing to look out for with them. You know, they're a very fast, powerful flyer as well. So interesting fact, uh, I'm sure some of you know this already, but the uh, the hobby is actually named after the table football game Sabutio. Uh, and very simply, it's because the, uh, the gentleman who invented it wanted to call it hobby. Uh, he wasn't allowed, so he named it after his favourite bird, which was Falco Sabutio, uh, which is the hobby, of course. So he still kind of managed to name it hobby just in a roundabout way. Uh, and subutio basically means subbutio, so sub buzzard, uh, smaller than a buzzard. So the name translates to a falcon that is smaller than a buzzard. Okay, so uh, as I said, the hobby is actually quite unusual because it largely predates dragonflies. So it's well worth going to a, a reserve like Amberley Wild Brooks uh, and watching hobbies hunt the dragonflies in the summer. Absolutely fantastic sight. They do also hunt hirundines, uh, you know, swallows and martins, swifts and bats, uh, and other swarming insects as well. Okay, so we're just going to play a quick game of what's that falcon. Uh, I say we're going to play a quick game. It's not really a game because I've actually put the names of them up. So uh, it's not really one you can play as such. Uh, but the hobby, as I said, very distinctive, long winged, uh, side shaped wings like a giant swift in flight. Uh, it has these very distinctive uh, sort of vertical uh, striping uh, on the chest and the belly. Um, the juveniles are a little bit different, but we're not going to go into the juveniles today. They have these very distinctive red I was going to call them red underpants, but let's call them red trousers, red trousers. Again, the juveniles don't really have the red trousers, but generally the red trousers are very, very distinctive uh, when you're looking at a hobby. Uh, and also this white throat with a very distinctive uh, sort of sub mustachial stripe as well. So they've got quite a distinctive uh, kind of facial hood. Now, in comparison to a much bigger falcon, which of course is the peregrine. So the peregrine has a much larger sort of darker hood as a whole. It's, uh, you know, it sort of has medium length wings, still relatively pointed, but not really kind of size shape in the same way the hobbies are. Um, it tends to have a more fanned, curvaceous tail, whereas the hobbies is quite square cut. Uh, and also it has these, uh, these kind of cross markings uh, on the belly and the chest, as opposed to those uh, kind of streaks that the hobby has. So next bird is the Merlin. The Merlin is a much, much smaller raptor, much more similar to a sparrowhawk, really, in terms of profile. Uh, it has relatively short wings. In fact, the short wings are really, really distinctive um, with a relatively short tail as well. Uh, and these kind of, uh, again, these, these uh, vertical striped markings and lots of cross hatching on the wings is quite distinctive, but they're very compact, really, really compact. You know, they don't have this uh, sweeping sort of arc-like flight shape that the hobby has. 
Um, they're almost more similar in profile to peregrine, but they look like a tiny peregrine because the males actually are only around about the size of a missile thrush. So very, very small. And the last organ really is the kestrel. Now, if you see a nice male kestrel like this, it's very, very distinctive. They're very long winged, they're very long tailed. In fact, if you see them in, in kind of direct flight, the long tail is really distinctive. Uh, and they have this, this dark terminal band. And even the females that are somewhat more uh, restrained in appearance still have this dark terminal band, uh, but they also have stripes all the way along the tail as well. Uh, and they don't really have the blue gray coloration that the males do. So there we go. So there's a few falcons in comparison. Okay, so if you were to see this buzzard, would you think it was a common buzzard? That is the question. Well, it's actually not a common buzzard. It's a much rarer species of bird. It's the, it's the Eurasian honey buzzard. Um, now it's not dissimilar to our, our, our common buzzard, but there are a few sort of details that are quite different between the two. Uh, the honey buzzard has a much smaller, almost like pigeon-like head. Uh, and also it has the very different markings along the kind of leading edge of the wing. So this marking that I've sort of uh, put in the circle on the honey buzzard is, is the carpal patch. Uh, and they tend to have these distinctive carpal patches, whereas the common buzzard has the, uh, the, the markings all the way along the leading edge of the wing. Now there is a bit of extra complexity as well, um, which I won't really go into, but, but that's quite sort of uh, quite diagnostic. Honey buzzard also has a very long tail, uh, whereas the common buzzard doesn't. The honey buzzard's tail is actually about the same uh, length as the width of the wing, whereas the common buzzard's isn't. And also looking at the end of the wing tips, you can see here that the honey buzzard, uh, the bases of those fingered primary feathers uh, are pale, whereas the common buzzard, uh, they're, they're all dark. So also the honey buzzard is actually very long winged. Some of you might have noticed it looks particularly long winged uh, in comparison to the common buzzard. So the honey buzzard, it's a very scarce breeding bird in Sussex, it has to be said. It really does live up to its name. You know, it feeds on sort of bees and wasps and, and, and honeycomb. Very, very unusual. Um, yeah, just very unusual, amazing though. They tend to arrive from late May. Uh, you can see here, they kind of inhabit this uh, overwintering region south of the Sahara. And, you know, generally our kind of warming climate and fairly extensive woodlands in Sussex, um, you know, really giving them quite a good base for kind of continued expansion. Um, so fingers crossed, you know, we'll be seeing more, more honey buzzards here in the future. Fantastic bird. So a couple of quick raptors just to look through. Um, passing through, you know, you might see a Montague's Harrier passing through if you're lucky. Uh, it used to breed in Sussex, but it was very, very rare. Um, you know, perhaps look out for them uh, in sort of late April to mid-May. Similar to a male hen harrier, but you can see the patterning uh, on the underwing is quite quite different actually from the male hen harrier. It's not as, uh, doesn't have the same kind of plain wing features that the hen harrier does. And also keep your eyes peeled, peeled for an osprey folks. So I mean ospreys, you know, they're definitely not averse to lengthy sea crossings. Uh, so you really might see them anywhere actually through, through spring and summer. So fantastic bird to see. Okay, so the last little mini section folks, we're just gonna look at the other birds now, which don't really adhere to any particular category. And this is a tough one to spot, a really tough one to spot. But if you were to go to a Sussex heathland at dawn or dusk in late spring or summer, and you heard this sound, what would you think it was? Okay, well, I'm sure many of you will have heard this and I can tell you folks that that is the sound of a churring nightjar. Uh, the nightjar is a pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal bird, to be honest with you. It's very, very unusual. It has this incredible cryptic camouflage. Absolutely amazing, uh, you know, to see them, you know, sort of camouflaged on the forest floor or concealed, you know, on a branch in the day. They really do, do just sit tight. Uh, so they blend in in quite, quite an incredible way. Um, you know, they are fairly common, but they're very localised because obviously their habitat preferences are quite unique. They tend to arrive quite late from early May. And you can see their overwintering areas are both in kind of West Africa and Southeast. Um, they have a very bat-like flight at, at night, to be honest with you, lots of rapid twists and turns. Um, and yeah, I mean, I really do urge you to, uh, you know, to get out on, up onto the Ashdown Forest or possibly over to Grafham Common or somewhere like that to try and see uh, Nightjar this summer. So during their display fight, often they'll clap their wings together. So I'm just gonna play that for you now. So just in case you are on a Sussex heathland and you think you've uh, you've heard, you think somebody's out there clapping uh, in the middle of the night, it's probably a nightjar. There probably isn't somebody out there clapping because that would be quite strange, wouldn't it? To be honest, it would be strange. Uh, but anyway, their local names uh, they include goat sucker because it was once thought that they uh, they drank milk from goats, 
uh, which they definitely don't, but uh, a bit, bit of a strange one, that one. Uh, and wheel bird as well. So wheel bird because their, their churring call sounds a little bit like that of a rolling wheel. Okay, so quick species spotlight. We're just gonna do the turtle dove. Very, very beautiful turtle dove. What a stunning bird it is. So the turtle dove, unfortunately, is a really, really heavily declining summer visitor. Uh, we've had a huge reduction in population of over 90% since the 1960s. Uh, but Sussex does now hold probably about three to 4% of the British total. Generally, they start to arrive from kind of April. And it's actually their, their song that often will alert you to, uh, to their presence. And it's what their scientific name uh, is derived from, Streptopelia tur tur. So it's the tur tur, which is a sort of rolling part of the song. So I'm just gonna play that now. <laughs> Beautiful sound of summer, but unfortunately uh, a very rapidly declining sound of summer, uh, very sadly. So most birds generally aren't seen until their kind of arrival peak in May, uh, and they uh, overwinter in a fairly narrow equatorial belt across Africa. They tend to typically breed in kind of open woodland, but they need lots of thick hedgerow and kind of mature cops. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately the turtle dove is, is probably dare I say it, the most likely species to become extinct in England as a breeding bird. Uh, and there are so many different factors that, that contribute to that, unfortunately. It's a real shame, real shame. So just a little bit about turtle dove migration. Uh, so it was only in 2014 that a turtle dove uh, named Titan uh, was actually the first one of his species uh, to have his entire journey mapped by satellite. So he completed this fantastic 11,000 kilometer round journey uh, at quite a quick speed and flying up to 700 kilometers per night absolutely phenomenal so just to show you his route uh, he left Mali on the 10th of May arriving in Mauritania on the 20th uh, then arriving in Algeria on the 22nd of May Morocco on the 29th Spain on the 7th of June southwest France on the 10th of June northeast France on the 18th and then across to the UK on the 22nd of June so there were a few more mini stopover points on that journey but just to show you as a whole, it took him about six weeks, essentially, to reach his uh, breeding grounds. Now, on the way back, uh, it actually was a little bit quicker. It was about a four week journey uh, following the East Atlantic flyway to return to Senegal. So uh, just a little bit of insight onto the uh, to the turtle dove journey there. And as you can see, he flew directly across the Sahara as well. So a tough journey. Now, you know, uh, as part of that, you know, turtle doves, essentially, they spend two thirds of their whole year outside of the UK. Uh, and uh, Operation Turtle Dive is actually developing kind of practical solutions to try and try and help bring this bird back from the brink because it would be really, really sad if we were to lose the turtle dive. It's very, very beautiful. So I have put a link for Operation Turtle Dive in at the end of the presentation. Okay, so last couple folks, uh, there's probably no British bird with a more familiar song than this one. And uh, for any of you thinking, what's that? Um, I mean, I don't know, you might be, you might not be, I've no idea. <laughs> It is, of course, this bird. There we go, folks. There we go. So, of course, it is the common cuckoo. Uh, you can't really mistake that that, uh, that that call, can you, to be honest with you? Interestingly, the female actually has quite a different call, and this is what the female sounds like. Yeah, she has a funny little bubbling call. Very, very different to the male. Now, interestingly... A lot of people might not recognize a cuckoo by sight. They're actually quite kind of raptor-like in flight, uh, but of course, because they're such an elusive, secretive bird, the simple fact is we just don't see them very often. Uh, and of course, we hear them far more often than we see them. Now, unfortunately, you know, it is a species in decline. You know, we've lost more than 60% of the cuckoo population, uh, although actually their numbers in Scotland uh, seem to have increased, but the numbers in England seem to have decreased. Um, and actually the data that's been collected from satellite track cuckoos has been a real kind of revolution in their conservation. It's really helped us to understand, you know, how their different migration routes uh, affect their survival rates. So you can see different routes taken by different cuckoos here on this map. Um, most of them, you know, choosing to actually cross the central part of the Sahara, uh, although there does seem one extraneous bird that's headed right out into the Atlantic. Uh, so and, unless it was looking for an island holiday, uh, then you can only assume that unfortunately it's been kind of blown out through uh, through inclement weather, uh, which of course is also always a risk, but it did make it back. So that, that's great. So, yeah, I mean, the declines could be due to declines in the host species, uh, you know, perhaps due to kind of changes in their nesting behaviour. But certainly, you know, uh, 
the, the sort of declines in the hairy caterpillars that they feed on uh, ha it, it is a real problem. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the continuing use of insecticides and, uh, you know, lowering sort of insect populations, uh, you know, numbers of insect populations probably has a big impact, unfortunately. So you can see here they're uh, the overwintering grounds, a vast kind of swathe of southern Africa. So quite a long journey for them. OK, and for me, folks, I wanted to kind of finish on this bird uh, because this really is the sound of summer for me. Oh, I love it. It takes me right back to childhood, that, folks, more than any other bird song. Absolutely fantastic. So that is, of course, is the screaming call of the common swift. Uh, generally, they arrive from late April. I think it's on the first swifts this year on the 30th. Uh, and, you know, they're a pretty common breeding visitor, but we see a lot as passage migrants. And that's because they have this really huge kind of breeding range all the way from North Africa, all the way over to Asia and all the way up to the, to the Arctic Circle. Um, you know, most over winter across this kind of broad sweep of uh, tropical Africa. And, you know, data seems to suggest that generally they come back via the Eastern Atlantic flyway uh, with just a single kind of restopping point in Liberia. So it, it's a very kind of constant journey. It's a very rapid journey. Uh, you know, swifts, of course, are fantastic flyers uh, and they complete that migration very, very quickly. Um, you know, urban nest sites, the, the lack of urban nest sites has been a real problem for swifts. You know, it has contributed to a decline in their numbers. Um, and unfortunately, that may well be even greater in southeast England than it is elsewhere. Uh, it is quite hard to census them, though, because they don't actually return to their nest sites very often. Um, yeah, and of course, you know, as, as, as with many species, you know, it's really modern building regulations that, that offer Swift very kind of little opportunity uh, for suitable nest sites. But fortunately now, you know, the increasing use of Swift boxes and Swift bricks, uh, you know, really is helping to at least secure the future of kind of individual colonies, which is really good. You know, for me, there is no more magnificent sight uh, than seeing a screaming squadron of Swifts uh, scything low through the urban streets, like a sort of jet fighter squadron. Uh, just absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. But of course, if they're not doing that, then you tend to see them flying quite high, uh, you know, sort of screaming away up there. Just, oh, they're phenomenal. They really are just a master of the skies, incredible birds. Okay, folks, well, just passing through, just the last couple, uh, one bird you might see passing through is a very unusual woodpecker species called the Rhineck. It's Europe's only truly migratory woodpecker. Uh, generally, the woodpeckers as a whole are very sedentary birds. Um, they used to breed in the UK, but unfortunately, by about the 1980s, they, they pretty much didn't. Uh, but you should look out for them passing through in both spring and autumn. Very unusual bird as well. Really, really strange. I can tell you a lot of strange things about Rhineck. Uh, but we don't have time because it's so dark outside that I can only imagine it's now about two in the morning. So uh, I think we I think we better conclude, to be honest with you. Uh, and the last uh, last bird is the hoopoe, the beautiful hoopoe. Um, and the hoopoes generally might uh, pass through in sort of late April. But any birds that are seen here are generally those that overshoot from the continent. Uh, interestingly, I think actually there, there was a hoopoe spotted in, in East Sussex uh, just a week or so ago, which does pretty much chime in with this timing. Um, you know, we have had hoopoes breeding in Sussex as well back in the 1970s, so keep your eyes peeled for them. Okay, folks, well, you'll all probably be pleased to hear that that is it. Uh, I've absolutely no idea why I put so much information in that presentation. Uh, I can only apologise, and if any, any anybody is still awake, then, um, then uh, thank you, thank you. So, uh, yeah, there we go. Thanks for listening anyway. And uh, just a little thank you to say uh, for all the photos. I'm sure I've probably missed lots of people out. So anybody that I have, uh, then I do apologise. And just to say, you know, we do depend obviously on our member support to help us through Sussex. So thank you everybody for that. Uh, and you're all members. So I don't know why I put this in because you're already joined. So there we go. Never mind. Should have taken that slide out, shouldn't I, Michael? <laughs> Maybe. But, uh, yeah. That's fine. Uh, that, 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 was, that was amazing. Thank you. That was uh, another epic. I was another James Duncan epic. That was... Uh, it's far too that long. was that was great. I, I really enjoyed. It. I love to hear the swifts at the end. That was oh, lovely to hear. Got to that was uh, got that was great. So um, as I mentioned, um, there's been a few a few questions as we went through, and some lots of lovely comments there. If you stop sharing your screen, uh, James, if you could, yeah, that's no. great. And I'll, uh, oh, okay. Look, I can know if I if I share mine. Look, uh, there we are. Look, uh, yeah. So thank you to James. Um, some lovely comments there. I, I passed the questions on to James. Uh, here's, here's one of your biggest fans. Someone sent me a photo during the talk, James. Is a big. Uh, is Jim the cat there? Um, oh, oh, the, the, watching the uh, watching the warblers. So, uh, <laughs> oh, I bet he'd love to get, uh, get his get his claws onto those, wouldn't he? 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's quite intriguing what that bird song. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure. uh, so, so thanks for that. Um, yes, yeah, so <laughs> I will just uh, just finish as usual by just point out some of the upcoming talks. So I'll be talking on uh, I'll be talking on Thursday about one of my obsessions, uh, extinct creatures. Uh, about my uh, my new book that's come out last week. Have you read my book yet, James? I've I do you know what, Michael. I've read most of it, and I have to say I really enjoyed it. It's fantastic. It's really really that's good. Good to hear. I thought, so, someone said online it was unputdownable. Obviously, you, you, you put it down at some point. I thought the whole point was you just... Uh... I, I did, but I had to make this epic presentation. So, oh, uh, fair enough. I'll, yeah, I'll let you off. That's the reason why. <laughs> I'll let you off. Uh, and then uh, James and myself uh, and, and Barry will be joined by the Wild Coast Sussex team for an, our Nature Table episode 12, the Seaside Special, uh, on Thursday, the 20th of May, looking at uh, some of the wildlife highlights you find around the South Coast. And then a new talk I'll be doing on uh, June the 22nd. So I'll, I'll be giving a talk all about the Wildlife Trust Nature Reserves. It's a Sussex Wildlife Trust Safari. So join me for a big trip around Sussex. I thought um, I was here at the start of uh, this pandemic uh, with, my, with my wildlife diary. And I thought after, after it should end on the, June the 21st, I thought I'd do a, I'd do a talk at the end as well. So, uh, so that, that's next month. That's another members only talk. So... Uh, if you enjoy this evening's talk, uh, as always, we ask if you're great if you can make a donation to support our work. Uh, as James pointed out, you're members anyway, so we'd like to thank you for your ongoing support of the Wildlife Trust. And as Debbie mentioned at the start of the talk, we've gained lots of new members, so welcome to you if you're a new member as well. So uh, we've been blown away by the support we've had in the last over the last year. So so thank you to everybody. Uh, at the end of the talk, uh, when this closes, uh, James put some notes about bird migration, bird song, and some uh, recommended bird books, which you'll find when you close this screen. And uh, it all just leaves me to say uh, a big thank you again to James. Thank you, James, for tonight's talk. Um, it's kind of like it's, it's kind of like a cuckoo. It's probably a pigeon, but it's meant to be a cuckoo. <laughs> but um, it's meant to you be get the pigeon. idea. Okay, well, I like it. Okay, really. all right, folks. Well, thank you again for supporting the Wildlife Trust, and thank you again to James. And uh, give us a wave, James. Thanks, everybody. Cheers, and we'll see you. We'll see you next time. Take care.